So hello everyone. So uh, welcome to today um seminar series of the CB and DC. So today uh we are happy to have Wilco of uh, DMB uh to to hold this session. Wilco is all yours. Thank you, thank you, Russell, um, and thank you for inviting me to the as a moderator to this uh, central banking and digital currency uh, online seminar series. Um, perhaps before we start, it's it's uh, useful to to keep track track of the the housekeeping rules the, the housekeeping notes so um the presenter our presenter today has been allotted 25 minutes can go for go ahead for 25 minutes then the discussion takes over and he has 10 minutes to discuss and then after that we will have some time for a q a and that will take about 20 minutes and we try to sort of conclude in an hour time from now and during this q a session um, panelists can unmute themselves to ask a question or make themselves clear. And the other attendees, please use the Q&A area, the Q&A box to ask questions. And I will do my best as a moderator to select uh, the interesting, well, all questions are interesting, of course, to select some of these questions and pose them to the presenter and the, and the discussant. And... Also note that this recording uh, or this conference or this seminar is being recorded and the video will be posted later on the website. So uh, just to inform you of that, well, let's quickly move on to our uh, seminar speaker today. Today's speaker is Antoine uh, Martin. Um, well, he has been, he's been around a while and he's been, he's been working at the, at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York for a, for a longer time. And he's a senior vice president and also the head of the money and payment studies um, department. His main interests and uh, research interests include money and banking, financial intermediation and economics of payments. Antoine, uh, the online floor is yours. You have 25 minutes. I'll give you a, a, a heads up three minutes before time is up if that's okay with you. And perhaps also good to note that if um, the panelists have a, a clarifying question, please go ahead, but let's limit that to only clarifying questions and the bigger discussions for the Q&A. Okay, Antoine, it's all yours. Please go ahead. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Volko. Uh, so this is joint work with uh, Michael Lee, who is also at the New York Fed and Rob Townsend from MIT. And before I jump in, uh, I have to remind you that these are my own views and not necessarily the views of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York or the Federal Reserve System. Okay, so, so in this presentation today, we're interested in an age-old problem of limited commitment. In financial markets today, traders meet and agree on a trade sometime before the action necessary to settle those trades uh, can happen. And the delay between the moment where these traders make promises to each other and, and the time where they have to fulfill those promises creates the opportunity for reneging on them because of limited commitment. And Markets have found a variety of ways to try to limit this issue, such as third-party mediation with intermediaries or platform, margin requirements or other use of collateral, long-term relationship reputations, things of that sort. Now, despite that, Selman fails still occur. So at the peak of the global financial crisis in the US treasury market, there was about 400 billion of Selman fails per day. And this problem was sufficiently serious that uh, a fails charge was introduced, which basically put a minimum cost of failing um, in, in the treasury market. And despite that, uh, while, while these measures did reduce the incidence of, of salmon fails, despite that, salmon fails still occur from time to time. Now, this is of interest. So sorry, the, the persistence of salmon fail is both an institutional and a technological feature of, of the current uh, arrangement. As I mentioned a minute ago, traders today have to submit instructions in order to uh, fulfill the promises that they've made at the trading stage when it's time to settle. And there's a delay uh, between those two activities occur. And if incentives break down, if uh, at the time where they have to take those actions to fulfill their promises, they no longer have the incentive to take them, settlement can break down. And this is of interest because with new technologies, particularly uh, the advent of uh, distributed ledger technologies and the possibility of having uh, smart contracts, self-executing programs, 
people are hoping that uh, it might be possible to resolve uh, settlement fails technologically. And in, in, in this uh, talk, I'll be talking about uh, the token system as a new type of settlement arrangement that could eradicate settlement fails through the programmability of assets. So programmability would enable traders to commit to settlement that is, at the time where they are making promises, they could guarantee that these promises will be fulfilled. And as I'll elaborate on, on a, in a minute, uh, this, this, in order for that to happen, there has to be a collapse between the time of trade and the time of settlement. That is, settlement has to be committed at the time where the traders are uh, negotiating the trade. And this is a feature that, that's uh, typically described in atomic settlement, this collapse between, between trading uh, and settlement. And so this would in, entirely eliminate the potential uh, for fails. So in today's talk, I want to talk about a market where traders have to enter interdependent trades to achieve the optimal allocation of a long-lived asset. And I'll describe that in more detail. But I'm going to hardwire in the necessity for, uh, for intermediation. There's going to be limited commitments. Temp traders will, will be tempted to break the contracts after the trade, or they will, they will make promises to each other, and they might have an incentive to renege on these promises. Uh, later, and what we're going to do is compare equilibrium trade and settlement under the legacy system. That is a system where uh, this uh, inability to commit creates frictions, and a token system where it's possible to eliminate settlement fails technologically. Uh, but but that might create other issues, as as I'll show. So the question that we want to ask in this paper is: Does a token system strictly improve on the legacy? on the legacy system. And perhaps surprisingly, that's not true in a setting where trading is endogenous and intermediation is essential, right? So these will be two key features of, uh, of the model. So you can eliminate settlement risk, but in order to do that, you exacerbate an information problem. Basically, what I'll argue is that the token system implicitly requires trader to reveal more information about the positions that they hold. And so what it does provide is it provides commitment, but with strings attached, so to speak. Like clearly in the environment I described, if you could just commit unconditionally, then you could achieve a better allocation than, than under the legacy system. But the token system does more than allowing you to commit. It commits, it allows you to commit under the condition that you reveal more information and that creates information problems I'll describe. So just to give you some intuition, suppose that we have an arrangement where A and B agree to trade in a, in a token system, right? So A, what, what happens, and I'll go into more details about this later in, in the presentation, at the time where they're negotiating uh, the trade, A and B are jointly writing a program, programming the asset so that settlement cannot occur, so that both uh, both legs of that trade will happen with certainty. And, and a basic requirement for this to happen is that each trader must have, must have ownership rights to the asset at the time the settlement must take place, right? It's, it's easy to understand intuitively that if you could just program assets that are not yours, then you could just, um, you know, make take somebody else's asset and make that asset be delivered in your trade. That would create obvious problems. But so knowing that you must own the asset in order to program it means that um, your, your trading partner has information about you that they can exploit in order to extract a better price from you. So this aggravates a holdup problem and it can break down trade altogether. All right, in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip the literature review and I'm gonna jump right into the model. So we have a model with three risk neutral traders, A, B, and C, and it's going to be a long lived asset, only one long lived asset, and it's initially owned by trader A. And traders are going to have period dependent payoffs, which I'll describe in a minute, that can be low, medium, or high. And in terms of timeline, there's going to be two stages. So first, traders are going to meet, and there's going to be two bilateral meetings between those traders. During those meetings, they're going to make promises to each other. They're going to negotiate a potential trade. And then after that takes place, there's going to be settlements, the settlement stage. Payoffs to the agents only occur at the settlement stage, depending on whether they hold the asset. I'll describe that on the next slide. And because there's this delay between trading and settlement, it is possible that 
agents will have incentives not to uh, to execute the trades they've promised to make at the settlement at the trading stage. So what are the the, the traders' payoffs? So the the payoffs differ uh, by period and by agents. They can be high, medium, or low, or or zero altogether. Um, so if you look at the, the first line, this is the payoff of agent A. The a agent A cares a little bit about holding the asset in period one and in period two, but cares a lot about holding the asset in period three. And agents B and C also have payoffs that, that, um, that are random in the sense that at the moment they trade, they don't know what will be uh, the value they attach to holding the asset. So in particular, during period two, uh, agent B might like to hold the asset moderately or not at all. And as will be more important later, for agent C, uh, that agent will, might care to hold the asset a lot at, at period three or not at all. That will be known, uh, but after the trading stage. So at the moment where agency trades, this is something that um, the realization of, of H uh, tilde is unknown. So the maximum payoff for holding asset in this economy is comes with uh, B holding the asset during the first period, C holding the asset during the second period, and the asset returning to A during the third period. So from a planner's perspective, this is the allocation you would like to be able to achieve. And that means that the efficient trades are going to be for A to lend the asset to B during periods one and two, so that B holds the asset during period one, then B lends the asset to C during period two, and C returns the asset to B, who immediately returns it to A, so that A holds the asset during period three. So can you achieve that in equilibrium? That's going to be what we're going to try to find out. So what happens at the trading stage? As I mentioned, there's two meetings that, are, that occur sequentially. One of these meetings is that a meets B, and the other meeting is between B and C. Now, the order of these meetings is random. Now, since B is part of both meetings, B knows who she meets first. But A and B and C never meet, and A and C don't know if they get to meet B first or if they meet uh, C second. So in this economy, B has to act as an intermediary between A and C. That's an important aspect for a result. Now, you could endogenize this uh, and, and you could create an environment where B has some superior uh, information or, or other properties that makes, uh, that makes her a particularly desirable intermediary. We're going to abstract for that, uh, but, we're, um, but our results should extend to, to, an, to an environment where we can we endogenize the role of B as, a, as an intermediary. Okay, so in a meeting, traders are going to negotiate a securities lending contract for sec settlement at dates one, two, and three. So the kind of arrangement they agree to is something like A lends the asset to B in period one at price P. And up to two trades can occur during the trading stage, one per, per trading stage meeting. And then at the settlement stage, so, so the trades specify our promises to make transfers between, between uh, these three traders. And so th those promises look like A lending to B uh, in period one. So that requires two transfers, or transfers from A to B at the beginning of period one, and a transfer to, from B to A at the end of period one. That was correspond to that. And, and so those actions have to take place uh, during the settlement stage and uh, might be subject to, to incentive constraints, as, as I'll describe. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to study two settlement technologies, one that I called legacy system, where incentive problems are, uh, where the, uh, uh, the, the inability to commit creates a problem because, because traders might have a, an incentive to renege on, on their promises. In one, the token system, where technologically you can solve the commitment problem, but you introduce information leakage. So let me get into that a little bit. So how does Salmon happen in the legacy system? In the legacy systems, during this trading stage, the only way an asset gets transferred from one trader to the other is if the owner of that asset initiates the transfer. And we're going to assume that, that failing to uh, act on a promise that has been made at the trading stage will cause the trader to suffer a cost, delta, 
we can think of that as a reputational cost or as a penalty like the fails charge that was introduced in the treasury market. And we're going to assume that uh, delta has an intermediate value. It's not so high that it prevents all fails. That would make the model less interesting, but it's not so low that fails happen all the time. But again, you, there is a sudden there's a cost for failing to settle, but there's no way for agents in this economy to commit to settlement, and their incentives might lead them to renege on their promises. Now, in the token system, bargaining, the act of negotiating a trade with uh, with, with another trader and programming the assets happens simultaneously. And programming the assets allows you to commit to delivery of the asset in the future. So the asset is programmed during the meeting that occur at the trading stage. Those transfer instructions are self-executing. They will happen even if no agent take any action. Further, um, it's impossible for a trader to prevent uh, the transfer of program asset from occurring, right? So by, by programming, you have self-executing um, movements of the asset that cannot, be, that cannot be prevented. And so this, this, this creates the ability to commit to, to promises, but it requires the holder of the asset, it, it, it requires the trader to hold the asset at the time where that commitment is made, right? Again, you can only transfer your own assets. You can't transfer other people's assets. So you have to hold the asset. And that means that both parties know at the time of trade uh, the, the, the position of the lender. If I'm entering in a negotiation with you to lend or sell you an asset, I must own the asset. And this is information that you're going to be able to use. Uh, in order to extract a better price from me. And I'll, I'll clarify that. Okay, so let's, let's see what happens in equilibrium, first in the legacy system, and then I'll talk about the token system. So there are two frictions that are gonna make it difficult in the legacy system to achieve the optimal allocation. One is a limited commitment problem, I'm gonna focus mainly on that, but I'll also talk about the holdup problem because both are interesting. So the limited commitment problem should be pretty clear what you're trying to do again, as you remember, is to transfer the asset from A to B for the first period, from B to C for the second period, and A really wants to hold the asset in the third period. But C, under, with some probability, really likes to hold the asset in the third period, and the value for C of holding the asset is greater than the cost of reneging on that promise of failing to settle. And so in if was probably lambda C, uh, agency really likes the asset, then, then trader C will, will fail. We'll keep the asset one more period and we'll fail on a promise to return the asset to B. And that will prevent B from returning the asset to A. So in this environment, B is the only trader who is matched with both A and C. And so for C to require the ownership of the asset, B must successfully negotiate both sides of the trades. And that means that it's possible for B to not value the asset very much but under the right circumstances to want to do this intermediation because it's beneficial. But, if, um, but because the, the trades occur in asynchronously, B must make market by completing one side of the trade in advance of the other, anticipating future trade. And that creates the potential for holdup problem, right? It, it's possible for C to make a low ball offer what happening here. So, so B needs to pay a price to A that may be in excess of her own valuation of holding the asset. And C could make a lowball offer to B because in, in case B has already uh, acquired the asset um, because, because the value of that asset is not so high, um, is not so high uh, for B and, and, and C can offer something that's just as good or, or slightly better. But if B was able to anticipate that, she would not want to engage in intermediation. That's the nature of the holdup problem. So what is the trader's C's um, temptation? The trader C's temptation is to offer something that's, that's less than, um, than B would like to, to receive in order to make uh, intermediation profitable. So, both A and B know that uh, in the legacy system, there is some probability that C will not return the asset if, if uh, was probably lambda C, the, the value of holding the assets is very high. Now for B, the reservation price at which she will always agree to intermediate on behalf of C corresponds to A's 
value for the asset in period two, which is L, plus the settlement risk premium, the, the risk to A that he will not get the asset back, which is uh, which constitutes the cost lambda CH, plus what I call the daisy chain premium. B knows that which probably lambda C, C will not return the asset, that will force B to fail on the promise to A, and that will cost B lambda C uh, delta. So if, if B can be confident that C will be willing to pay at least this much to borrow the assets, then B is always completely satisfied uh, to do the intermediation because intermediation will be at least uh, zero profit or, or, or better. That value is increasing with lambda C. If B is worried that uh, C might offer something that's lower than that amount, that might discourage B from, from being an intermediary, from, from conducting that trade. So what happens if B has already traded with A, right? So first B meets with A, agrees to pay a price to borrow the assets for two period. Now that trade is sunk. That means that at the time where B is meeting with C, B knows that she will be holding the asset at period two. And, and if C offers a low value, essentially the expected value of B to hold the asset uh, and uh, the expected cost of uh, the daisy chain uh, failure, in that case, B will agree to lend to C even though the total intermediation uh, will, will will generate a negative profit, but it's too late to, uh, to change that. Now, what limits this risk is that C does not know if B has met A prior, and C does not know if B has obtained the assets from A. And, and this opacity about the order of trade, or order of meeting, and, and whether B has obtained the asset is going to discourage uh, C from taking advantage of the situation and making a lowball offer. So what we can show is that if the limited commitment problem is not too severe, then the optimal trades will, will be achieved with certainty. If um, the limited commitment problem is uh, severe, then not all of the good trades will happen with certainty. And basically, uh, in order to guarantee that uh, C offers a high enough price, B will be forced when uh, she meets A first to with some probability just refuse to trade. And, and because uh, C knows that, uh, that this might happen, that reduces the incentive to make a lowball offer. And that means that some optimal trades cannot occur in, in this economy. So what are the strong features of the system? There's this complete decoupling between trading and settlement. Traders must enter contract, well, sorry, are allowed to enter contract without explicit proof that they, they can fulfill those contracts. And that allows B to hide from C whether she has met A before or whether she has purchased the assets. And so you have this interesting situation that there's an interplay, a valuable interplay between the trading system and the settlement system. The fact that trades occur asynchronous, asynchronous, oh yeah, asynchronously and that there's no transparency over the history of trades might seem in isolation to be problematic. But they are essential, this decoupling is essential to facilitate the intermediation of this long-lived asset between multiple traders. It is very useful to have opacity in order to allow trades to occur and resolve the potential holdup problem. So what happens in a token system? In a token system, uh, as you might remember, the whole point is that you can eliminate the risk of, of, of settlement fail. Um, C, we know we want to hold the asset at at day three, but B and C can agree to program the assets so, such that it will be impossible for C to hold on to it. The assets will automatically return to B at, uh, at the end of period two. And this will occur regardless of the incentives of C to fail. So this is great, right? It allows B, C to commit and it should eliminate, uh, it, and it does eliminate the commitment problem. But the issue is that it's going to worsen the holdup problem, as I'll describe next. It also creates an issue with trade and asynchronicity, which is somewhat less interesting, but I'll, I'll briefly touch upon as well. So why is the holdup problem worsened? Well, now when B meets C, 
B must reveal whether or not she has ownership of the assets, right? In a system, in a token system, for, to be able to program the assets, you must have the ownership right from that asset. So if B doesn't have the asset, there is no potential for even negotiating a trade because you can't deliver on that trade at the moment of trading. You can only deliver on that trade. You can only enter a, a, a productive negotiation if you own the asset. And that means that C knows that behold the asset, and that increases the incentive to make a lowball offer. Remember, in the legacy system, B benefited from the fact that C couldn't be sure that she had the asset. Now, C knows with certainty at the moment of trading whether B holds the asset. And that means that the, the um, C's optimal strategy is to is going to be to offer an extremely low price, and this can kill uh, B's incentive to uh, to intermediate entirely. And I'll get back to that. The other issue is trade in synchronicity. So, in this environment, we've uh, hardwired the fact that the order of trade is random, was probably one half. That means that in some cases, A is going to meet with B during the second half of the trading period. So when B and C meet, there's simply no asset to be traded because the, the asset hasn't been uh, obtained yet. And that means that no trade is possible with probably one half. Again, this is a feature we could endogenize. We could have a system where through some efforts, um, agents are able to modify the order of trade or they can search uh, at some cost. Um, but, but, it, but uh, that would not eliminate our results. It would continue to be the fact that it is much the, the order of trade is much more essential in a token system compared to the legacy system, and that would have a cost that needs to be borne somewhere in the economy. So we think we're fine by simplifying the model and just um, just going with with hardwiring of the timing. Okay, so the result and is one, that and yes. one, you have, you have three more minutes to yep. to reach a conclusion. Thank yes, you. perfect. Thank you. Um, so I'm practically there. Okay. So, so if the holdup problem is fine, then C will never get the asset. Because if the value of B is sufficiently low, if B doesn't value the asset for itself enough, then, then B will refuse to, to intermediate. B only, is, only agrees to intermediate assets that she values enough for herself. Otherwise, C will obtain ownership of the asset, but only was probably one half when, when the order of trade is, is exactly the right one. So what do we see? Well, we, we have an environment where depending on the parameters, either system could be dominant. The token system that promises commitment, but with string attached is going to work well if the commitment problem of C is extremely uh, high and if B values the asset enough, right? So basically, Token systems are valuable in environments where the intermediaries care about the assets they intermediate for themselves. But it's going to, it, it's not going to work well in environments where the intermediaries do, do pure intermediation, intermediating assets that they don't want to hold themselves. Um, and, and so that eliminates uh, arguably a very important role for intermediation, which is that you can, you can uh, hold assets on behalf of other agents that you don't really care to hold for yourself. And so if Lambda C and Lambda B are sufficiently low, then the legacy system actually will do better from a welfare perspective than, uh, than the token system. All right, um, so to conclude, uh, tokenization has clear advantage. It does allow agents to completely eliminate uh, a limited commitment problem. But as I've tried to argue, it comes with strings attached. Collapsing the trading and settlement comes at a cost um, because it reveals information. And, and we know uh, that in finance, too much information can kill risk sharing opportunities or beneficial trades. And this is exactly what happens here. And so some features of tokenization are just not amenable to certain market structure. If in a market where um, intermediation is valuable, um, tokenization can be problematic and, and lead to lower welfare. And, and so one of the things, one of the interesting things that, that our model highlights in addition to, to, to the key result is that efficient settlement uh, protocols are intric intricately tied to, uh, to their trading mechanisms. 
Uh, and in, in, in OTC markets, in markets where you rely on intermediation, the trading mechanism, that kind of, of trading only works uh, with certain types of settlement or works better, I should say, with certain, arra certain settlement arrangements. And with that, I'm all done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antoine, uh, for this clear presentation and spot on uh, in terms of time. Let's now move on to our discussion today. Our discussion is Tiu Hei. And I hope I pronounce it right. Um, he's a professor of finance at the University of Chicago in the Booth, Booth School of Business. Uh, Chu's uh, main research interests include well, various topics in financial markets and macroeconomics with a special focus on contract theory and banking. But recently he has also been writing articles in the area of cryptocurrency and blockchain. Chu, um, you have 10 minutes, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. I, although I did it many, 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 many times, still have the issues. Uh, this is a very interesting paper. I'm glad that I'm uh, being asked to discuss. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, so it may fundamentally change the settlement in financial markets. Uh, that's a, something... Uh, you know, not always being the center of a financial research, uh, because of in a way that the settlement itself, we in the, we long time ago we thought it was too detailed to study, uh, but uh, during crisis, you know, Antoine presented some other things that are you know, showing that this sometimes we will we nagging, uh, nagging the the system, and a lot of efforts, uh, uh, research uh, focus get move on to this if. This is this area. Uh, blockchain obviously, you know, promoted this idea called automatic execution when conditions met. Uh, so page four in this paper says the following: Progr programmability, programmability enables traders in the tokenized market to enter trades that are de facto insulated from credit and a counterparty risk. That is a really fascinating. Point and uh, I will just explain one application in the second slide. Now the uh, the paper is just asking a simple question: Is this always good? Um, you know, you, I without reading the paper, I will say it's you know in general it's good. Uh, will depends on certain setting, but it, like economists are very good at uh, figuring out that uh, what could go wrong, right? Uh, so, so, so what they do is basically arguing that it materially alters the information environment for economic agents who then distorted their strategies in Colorado. I really like this way of thinking. Like a lot, lot of times is that you know, uh, indeed that, that these kind of a distortion could have a very, very big macro impact, and uh, often the time that we do not foresee when we implement these changes. Okay, so I will. Uh, in in some sense, it's a general perspective shared by my paper with Will, arguing that uh, the the I O setting that uh, that could change. But I will just uh, let me explain that their stuff first, and then telling you the connection. This fundamental information issue is typically ignored in computer science community because they have a different way of thinking about information. I think that that's the key. All right, so let me just spend one minute to tell you about the flash loan. To me, to me, that's a fascinating idea, and also it's it's actually is is working there, right? So it's an interesting development toward this direction. It's a basically a smart contract allow for the programmability of enforce the so called automatic execution. And to mention that this is a loan, which is basically saying that you know I borrow and I lend only being executed when both the conditions are met. So just immediate, you know, if you, you were not saying, oh, I'm lending to you, worry about the paying back. Why this is important? You find, you know, if you don't, you're not that into the finance side, you probably say, okay, what it, whatever it is. It is really just open the, open the new gate of this like a riskless arbitrage. And we do, you know, as a finance guy that we think arbitrage is such an important force to making sure market is efficient. Uh, often the time we will say, you know, so-called limits to arbitrage because of the 
timing issues, right? You enter the trade and you don't owe the price moves out of surprise, or sometimes that just people just negate negate on the trend. All these things that with the better infrastructure, we can making sure that the price of a one the law of one price, that's the fundamental cornerstone of the financial market, uh, become more relevant. Okay. Okay. So let me just tell you the model. I saw a question in the in the in the uh, chat room saying just it wasn't clear. I you know I don't I'm not sure that my explanation will make it more clear, but just different way to explain it. And maybe that works. Uh, so there are three people. A, B, C. You can see that these H, uh, H are the other 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 guys that who really like this, uh, you know, getting the uh, benefit of holding. So as a result, the optimal path is this way. There are two trades to to implement that that path. One is this between A and B, saying that okay, uh, you give it to me, and then a little, later on at the time two, I'm gonna return back to you. So that that's basically the CAB13 that I used in the in the paper. If you want to uh, read it, okay, it's not easy to read. I have to warn you. <laughs> uh, and then the second trade is basically B2C. So that's circulated here. That's called a CBC23. Uh, two three means the two is from B2C and the three is C2B. Okay. So the question when I read it at first is that uh, do you really need these repo contracts? Uh, probably yes, probably no. I, you know, it's just uh, it. I I I really applaud uh, the authors to come up with the uh, with this setting to exactly implement what they, they want to say. Uh, uh, this is a limited commitment as well as a holder per problem. But I really hope that uh, you know if, to me the issue is uh, so fundamental that uh, maybe you could uh, do a, a simpler. Uh, version of it, but anyway, that uh, this kind of a repo effect is just when you do the contract, you promise the future doing something else. Seems to be important for the one set one one friction, which is a limited commitment. So this is a limited commitment, which is the basic friction that uh, drive everything, or almost everything, except that the first that I have a hold up. I'm gonna explain. Uh, so this limited commitment is that uh, the C guy that uh, later on he might find this this asset very very uh, valuable to him to code. So therefore, that even though he promised the early, early on to trade, but then he would say, you know, whatever it is, I'm I'm not enter the uh, finger, put the finger on the on the on the trade, is then he will keep it. So it, I would you know just a small thing that I put an H tutor. Uh, in contingently at minus epsilon because then it will make sure that the, the you know it's clear that in the social perspective that always this path is the optimal one but really it does not matter it's just the minus epsilon okay so that's the that's the model and another question that the two systems how do we do it so this is a legacy system legacy system has this uh, there are two two key issues one is the trading stage Trading stage is called AC, you're going to meet with B sequentially. So initially when I read it, I wasn't paying too much attention. Turns out to be a very important part of the trade-off. Uh, there's no recall. This means that, you know, I met you once, then we just, uh, we didn't leave the phone number to, to come back to you, okay? I do believe that those things are very, is, is, is a, uh, 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 very relevant to, in certain circumstances where you just trade like a super fast way, uh, but uh, when you think about the VC context, just, just not a, not a true at all. Right? Okay, so and it's also important is that in order to prevent the uh, 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 bargaining with the private information, it's A and C make it take it over leave it offer to B. Uh, a and C doesn't have a private information. B has because B knows. When did he meet A and C? In what order? Okay, uh, but but you know, bargaining game without the information is much easier to solve. So AC make a difference. The holdup problem is reflected in some low price to be offered by C, which Antoine did a great job in presentation. But I'm not sure I was working so hard to read their paper. Uh, was just, just, you guys, you know, whatever you. 
talked about it in the in the in the in the presentation. Move there with some examples will help quite uh, quite a bit. Okay, so essentially that it may, is that in the hold up problem is basically if I know that it be already had it, then C going to say that we're going to just give you a whatever your uh, your holding value reservation value because B at that time doesn't have any uh, bargaining power. The settlement stage, uh, then, then C may renege that solution. Okay. So legacy system. Chu, Chu, please, Chu, uh, just to interrupt a little bit. You have three more minutes. Good, good, good. Yes, to yes, complete. Yes, okay. Yes, thank you. So uh, legacy system is the comments is quite clean on the limited commitment issue. The delivery of a hold up. Uh, uh, delivery means like the model to deliver that idea, not the delivery asset. Can be significantly good. I already talked about that. Example will be very important. You mute yourself. Sorry. You in the end, you basically focus on certain corner solution anyway. So here is my understanding. Okay. So for C, ideally is facing B who is stuck with the S asset offering a price of EM tilde. What's EM tilde? M to M is the reservation price. It's a value. You can choose the zero in some sense. Then, okay. So EM is, is B's holding value. If C is unsure, then the price will be higher. That's the equilibrium efficient price you're going to make uh, if you want to make in, in, implement the data, 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 data path. And uh, and, and when M is low, that's high, right, basically. So B gains bargaining power by opacity. That's, you know, I believe that's a very general result. In equilibrium, actually, B randomized, saying that even if I meet A, I'm going to say, you know, I'm not a trader with you, to make sure I'm uh, unsure, to make sure I'm unsure. That kind of idea. Ah, okay. B as an interior benefit of answer. So, so, so that's the key logic. And I think that, uh, you know, it uh, works just that uh, you, Perhaps you can do it a, a more cleaner way. <laughs> okay, tokenized system, very clear. That in tokenized system, there are two inefficiencies, as, a, as Antoine, had, Antoine already told you. One is a random sequential meeting, so only trade with half a probability, um, which kind of like is very, very stark. I think Antoine defended a little bit when he, he was a presentation. So he, May could be empirical relevant depending on application. I already said that. What's any hold up problem? I hope it's already clear now. Is that now if you enter into probable uh, 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 trade, then I know that you have the asset, that therefore I will give you a low bar off. That's it. That's my concluding remarks. I think it's a very fresh and innovative. Uh, 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 perspectives, uh, uh, information going to affect the equilibrium pricing and the intermediation. And it just, just to link back to my paper with, with the con written uh, several years ago, but we were imagining this like on more like uh, uh, not the financial side, but uh, in that trade finance context. It's basically blockchain technology alters the nature of a monitoring among firms because every firm behave as a node to to let's say you know no uh, uh, this is like uh, you know uh, uh, called a called a verification node and uh, then then it's the monitoring problem that uh, in green portal just immediately changes kind of share the same feature and I hope I, I do think that this is a very important uh, concept that uh, often just ignored by by at this point is mainly technological advancement so last point is that it will be nice to discuss a certain application. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Chu, for a very provoking discussion. Before we open the floor for the Q and A's, um, perhaps uh, Antoine, do you want to sort of make a quick reply to, let's say, a brief reply to what Chu was 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 sort of saying? Yeah, happy to. So thank you for uh, the great comments. Uh, I think I agree with everything you've said. So uh, what I'll take away is we we need to improve the presentation of the paper. I I want to again mention. Uh, two of the things that, that, that you pointed out. So um, 
the model for it to be as simple as possible, we, we make stock assumptions. First, in terms of the fact that B has to be an intermediary. This is, uh, this is hardwired into the model. And in the fact that the, 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 the timing of the trades um, is, uh, is also um, uh, something that, that uh, agents cannot share change. Now, I, I do believe that both of these things could be endogenized at, at the cost of considerable um, uh, complexity, but but I don't I don't think it would modify the, the key results. And so I think to to your point, it is that, that it points to the fact that these concerns are particularly relevant in markets where intermediation is is important, and in markets where uh, the timing and order of trades uh, is um, is reasonably fast. So yes, it, uh, in case of, of venture capital or things like that, I think that that's not a, a big issue. But but in, in financial markets where people trade at, even if there is recall, there's a cost of having of talking to the wrong person first. And so, if if you have to reach out to many different counterparties before you can go back to the the, the counterparties you really want to get to, uh, those those would add to the cost. So I think it it suggests that our that our model would continue to um, to deliver similar results even in in in, a, in an environment where um, where we endogenize these aspects. And and I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Antoine. It's now time to open the floor at, at the Q&As. And let's do it like this, that the panelists, they uh, are able to unmute themselves and ask questions themselves. And perhaps via raising a hand, I already see a hand. And the other attendees can write questions in the Q&A chat area. I already see a few there. Uh, perhaps let's first move. Um, Jonathan was the first to raise a hand. Jonathan, please yeah. uh, go ahead. First of all, th thank you for the very interesting talk. I think it's uh, asking very fundamental questions and very important for understanding you know, the limitation of a smart contract. So I want to follow up with uh, on Sigurd's on one of the points and the example, which is uh, the flash loan example. And at the end, he also mentioned this contingent execution. It seems to suggest that maybe smart contract can also expand the contract space, right? Say maybe when you sign the two contracts, these two contracts execution can be conditional on each other, and the terms can be conditional on each other. So I was wondering, by doing this, would it you know, mitigate the holdup problem? Let's say when you try to offer me bad terms, right? maybe by doing that, maybe it will you know, cancel the whole the other execution of the other leg, or maybe the term. Yeah, so this is a great question. I'll I'll take a shot, and then uh, if Michael wants to add anything, I'll, I'll let and get there. Um, I think so. Um, our our objective in, our, in this paper is to show that there are real limitations to have commitment with strict attached. And so one argument that, that that you've made and other people have made is like, oh wait, perhaps we could redesign our financial system to get around that problem. And I don't think we're making any. Uh, claims that it's impossible to redesign the financial system around those kinds of constraints. But at a minimum, we're saying like, that's a pretty serious redesign. So we can't just say, hey, let's implement this technology and not worry about unintended consequences. But, but fundamentally, our model doesn't speak to, uh, to the point that, that you're making, which is perhaps there is uh, a, an interesting way to get around this constraint. But, but one way or the other, you have to deal with, with the constraint. So I think it's a great point. And um, I guess I'm sidestepping uh, that a little bit. Michael, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. And, and it goes to the question about uh, our tolerance about settlement risk. Uh, now, our stance is we're showing that uh, um, unequivocally eradicating settlement uncertainty may not should not be the objective when we're trying to redesign the system. So if we have a tolerance for settlement risk, we can arrange for contingent execution that can sometimes fail but that can still alleviate some of the issues that we're showing, for example, with the ordering of trades. So Jigo, as Jigo and Antoine both kind of talked about, uh, the order of trades matters whenever you have to be able to credibly commit at the time that you meet. So that's a huge issue if there's a, a huge randomness to when you meet someone and when you can actually bargain with someone. Uh, now, uh, contingent execution means that, oh, well, I can agree to trade conditional on me 
finding a different arrangement in the future. And that, that I think is the direction that we need to think about. Um, and this is kind of a, a big tech takeaway as we're thinking about certain applications in very institutional markets like repo markets and other money markets. Uh, there has been a push to, in, to completely eradicate this kind of time between trade and settlement in repo markets. And, and we're, we also kind of discuss a little bit about the practical applications that are going on right now. And I think there, the, the, the takeaway is before you think that this collapse is desirable and necessary, we need to think about the other complications might, that might occur, given that a lot of these markets heavily depend on intermediaries. I saw another hand. Cyril, your, your hand is down again. Um, is your question answered or do you want to raise a question, Cyril? Yeah, hi, everybody. Um, <clears throat> So this was Hello. a similar question as Janet. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, prima. Yeah. Yes. So it was it was a similar question as Jonathan. It was basically on the fact that the two parties could set up an escrow account where uh, you know when both sides deliver their assets in the escrow account, then the escrow account frees the asset to the other party, and so essentially you can solve the information problem in this way. Um, so I was wondering what Antoine was thinking about this, um, this idea or this, you know, the fact that the technology allows for this type of accounts to be set up. So, uh, you know, all in all, I would be much more optimistic than the authors regarding uh, what the technology allows us to do in the future. Yeah, so I mean, I think I'm going to have uh, I'm going to answer uh, in a similar way to to the way I answered uh, Jonathan's question. I think it's really interesting to think uh, about these potential uh, ways of redesigning the financial system around around new arrangement, but I don't think that's costless. Um, in uh, so so it is uh, again somewhat outside of the scope uh, of our paper, but um, all of these attempts require uh, significant changes. And uh, if we undertook that, say in a different paper, it would be interesting to see if 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 that creates other potential problem that that we haven't foreseen. Uh, let me just add. Uh, I think it, the escrow point is really helpful to understand also um, a broader kind of benefit that we're actually highlighting in our paper, which is in a token system, you can eradicate settlement on trades for assets that you don't currently possess in your account. So we're not arguing that you need to own the asset literally at the time of trade. You need to own the rights to an asset in the future. So uh, there, conceptually, this already is very innovative relative to the legacy system where ownership is, uh, is a point in time thing. You need to have the asset in your account. That's when you're the owner. If you don't, then you're not the owner. Uh, the second aspect is that, you know, in principle, what we do want to achieve is to avoid any level of collateralization that's unnecessary. So uh, one way to easily kind of resolve a lot of these issues is to incorporate uh, collateral, which we're already kind of doing in a lot of arrangements or penalties. Uh, the hope is that we can redesign it in a way that we can um, minimize the liquidity costs associated with other practices that can kind of prevent these types of issues. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for this um, uh, additional information. I'm looking at uh, the Q&A box now, and um, I saw, I'm sort of browsing a bit. I saw a question of Jamie, but I have the feeling, I cannot see that completely, that this question on flash loans was already answered. Uh, in the in the, in the box, um, uh, Jamie asked if if let's say the if you do that uh, if you have these flash loans using the blockchain and the repayment must be included in the same block, does that mean that time elapses between a provisional loan and an actual loan and repayment? And he expanded actually on that, um, but that question is gone, I believe. So. Gio, did you already, I saw your writing, did you already um, send an answer there? Yes, I think I did. And 
to me from the economist perspective, if things are sure and then within three seconds, four seconds, even within one day, that why would those things matter? Like the elapse, time elapse. Um, that that's yeah. So that's my answer. Maybe you have some <laughs> other perspectives that could matter. But but I, so one thing that's important, and Jamie just raised his hand, so maybe he'll he'll want to clarify. But the, the idea of provisional loan is uh, is potentially problematic here because there is no loan unless there is the repayment. Um, so so uh, unless all of the asp all of the the legs of the trades are part of the same block, none of them actually exist. Uh, so there's no in that sense there's no time allowed. But Jamie, do you want to add something? Yes, uh, thank you very much. This is a great presentation, great discussion. Uh, yeah, my question on flash loans is, is that similar to the difference between trading and settlement? Because I can go out and get a loan, do a bunch of arbitrage, and if it works out, then I can submit all of that to the block uh, and it, it all settles. If it doesn't work out, of course, it reverts back to the original case. Uh, so isn't that similar to uh, kind of a, a time um, between, I mean, it's a different thing than trading and settlement, but uh, you can try out all these arbitrages, can't you, without, uh, without penalty uh, before they become a part of one block and are traded and settled. Maybe I will just, you know, I, kind of like your question getting to, to me, the right direction, and then some of the parts of a comment like lead me to think that I'm not a totally understand your point. Let me just, just you know, I think that this is a shared with Antwerp, is that the, the idea of a riskless arbitrage, that's like foundation of, a, you know, when we do PhDs, like the first, first time that we learn this finance is saying that there's a two price, same exact asset. You ideally, you want to trade at the same time. So that you profit, you make the profit. But that never being the real world, that you always get into the issues. So here, let's say you, do, you want to do arbitrage. And then now this infrastructure innovation basically provide a possibility of doing that. Uh, you can put uh, even a little more complicated uh, execution strategy says that if that price is above that, if that the other side of price is below that, and then put it into the block and then making sure that you at least make that kind of profit. This is what I meant. And I do think that in this type of a situation, whatever the time elapse, I do not think it really matters that much. So yeah, and just to add, Jamie, I think, I think you're right that uh, flash loans allow you to collect a bunch of different trades at different prices, and then if uh, and then you you can submit them all together if you think that that's beneficial, or you or, or uh, you can submit none of them, um, and and basically the there will be no trade unless all of the um, all of the legs together can be um, part of the same block. Thank you. So, uh, reading also in in the Q and A um, uh, room area, uh, there is a, there is a question by Francesca Carapella. I think Francesca, you can also unmute yourself. Perhaps you want to raise this question. Hi. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Anton. That was very nice. Um, I just had a quick question about whether there is an implicit assumption that uh, only the asset can be programmed, but the parties to the contract cannot write a smart contract, so a piece of code that can be tailored to whatever needs they have and they want, and that is triggered once the asset, let's say it's key, is inputted in, is put as an input in the contract. So it sounded like if this was the case, if you allowed for, let's say, a smart contract with all of the contingencies that the parties desire, and that smart contract is trigger, triggered when the input is provided, then some of the results in the tokenized economy uh, might, might disappear. Would, would that be a fair conjecture? So I, I don't think uh, that works. Um, and again, I'll take a shot and Michael will uh, clarify everything that I say that's wrong. Uh, but we have a companion paper um, 
also with Rob, where we where we um, dig deeper into the, the, this idea of, of programmability, and we uh, look at at some of these options where a trader could have multiple accounts and do like fake, um, you know, uh, transfer the assets in in specific accounts. What if he or she wants to fail. And so basically, in order to really guarantee the absence of failure to settle, you need to have very, very specific condition. And I think that the kind of uh, contingent contract that you imagine would not be robust to that because they would allow traders to sort of uh, circumvent. Um, so basically, you're, you're, you're setting these conditional payments, and then the trader could choose to make sure that the particular contingency doesn't occur so that the settlement that was promised doesn't occur when they want that the when they want to keep the asset um, Michael do you want to add anything to that yeah I, I, this is a pretty important point and I, I think uh, so I'll, I'll give you a very simple counterexample for why there's a settlement risk issue here uh, so in, in the context of our model B obtains the asset and anticipating that maybe he can sell it to C. Now you could imagine that B can not share that information and instead say, look, if I have the asset, I'll sell it to you. Now, what that means is that B always retains the option to also renege on his contract with C. Because now, as long as you're able to control the asset in any set of accounts, if, if after you agree on that kind of trade, if D comes over and says, oh, we'd like to have, I'd like to buy the asset from you and offers a higher price, well then B can now fail on the settlement agreement with C and importantly, without any repercussions in the token system where the contract technically has not been broken. So I, I think this goes kind of a, uh, in our paper, we don't uh, deal with this explicitly because um, this kind of thinks more deeply about what the conditions are for avoiding settlement risk. Uh, but because of this issue, you know, simply providing more flexibility with the contracting will not necessarily resolve this issue. Uh, and and that's, that's, we just need one friction. If B has different set of preferences, maybe he has outside opportunities, he can still, there's a new settlement risk that, involved, that arises. Now, I think the broader takeaway, though, is not that the smart contract environment is, can be powerful. I think it can be. The thing is that uh, practitioners and a lot of policymakers are focusing on completely getting rid of settlement risk. And our kind of takeaway is maybe we should be a little bit more open to that and think about unlocking the potential to facilitate trades, even when there is some settlement risk um, in, in the way that we're describing right now. Can I add a one more? Please do. Uh, so, so I really like it. Uh, uh, Michael's point, and I think that if you keep keep pushing this, keep pushing this, because then you will say, you know, let's write D on the on the contract, right? But once you're pushing this, pushing this, in the end, you need some uh, very, very, very valid, like uh, those, like a uh, 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 called a called oracles that uh, you need to trust, <laughs> and at the end, they're gonna make the final nail saying okay this is the right thing to the right contingency to to write, write write on i think that's in some sense that it defeated the purpose of a smart contract because in the end we have to ask uh, what are we trust in the end um, that's always that i have i do think there's a lot of limitation on smart contract just to be honest thank you sorry See can you. i follow up can I, sorry, oh. Wilco, I yeah, just no want to follow up go, with go Michael's ahead. point. Um, it, thank you for that. Uh, and that's, uh, that's insightful. Uh, thank you very much. The, the follow up on that, though, the thought that I have is, but in the model, because what you described is absolutely reasonable, but outside the model, in the model that you guys presented, if you allow for a smart contract of the, let's say, basic type that I described, then you would not have that trade off for the tokenized economy that you have. So you would solve the problem of, you, you would go back to some opacity, let's put it that way, in the model, in, your, in this paper. So there is, there's got to be an implicit assumption, I, I, I'm guessing that this type of basic smart contract rather than programming the asset, so I presume turning the asset into some sort of uh, 
token that uh, like a liquidity pool tokens, I guess, uh, and uh, program that token with the features that you described exactly as you described it now. But in this paper, if, if you allow for a simple bare bones smart contract, you would get the opacity back, wouldn't you? Antoine, I have to think about. To... Oh, sorry, go yeah, ahead. I, I actually think about it more uh, a bit more before I can give you a definitive answer. Uh, um, the way that I, I think about it, if we allow them to have contingent kind of trades where they can actually fail on settlement, then yes, I think it's Pareto improving. Uh, the caveat here is that once we think about a more general payoff structure for B as well, uh, there's still inefficiencies and it still will not obviously dominate the legacy system. So I, I think there's a trade-off still that emerges, but you're absolutely correct. And that's part of the point that we are trying to make as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Francesca and Michael. Um, it's 6.05, well, in Amsterdam at least. Uh, perhaps we have... Um, Time for one last question. And there is one in the Q&A box um, that is pretty high in the list. That was by Holger. Um, oh, uh, Holger, do you, do you want to ask your question live? I, I can do so. Yes, thank you. Sorry, I'm not sure whether my camera is on. But anyway, um, so my, my question basically is, uh, is this tokenized uh, token economy that you describe here, is this actually tantamount to saying that uh, if I have to own that security in order to make the smart contract on it, that more or less the security is no longer fungible really. I really have to have that token and that is being delivered also back at the end of the, uh, say of the repo trade. Um, I mean, and is there, I mean, is this actually inevitable? Can only this be done? Or could one also make a smart contract on something else uh, with a wallet account, whatever, but but where, where basically I can say, okay, I make a smart contract where I will deliver this security in say two days, uh, and then I still have the possibility to get it uh, in the meantime. Of course, this would mean that the settlement risk would not be addressed in this token, uh, in this token economy. Uh, on the other side, it would allow that the intermediary system uh, can still prevail then in the future. So that's, that's basically yeah. one of my questions. So I think I agree with that. And I think this is what Michael was emphasizing earlier, which is, mm -hmm. um, if you're willing to give up on settlement um, certainty, then then you can get uh, good outcomes and, and perhaps take advantage mm -hmm. of uh, of programmability. And so our, our point is not to say that programmability is bad in and of itself, is that it's not a perfect solution to solving settlement risk because it's commitment with strings attached. Um, so I think the one thing I wanted to add also to your example is there's a sense in which it uh, can uh, create issues with fungibility, but also... Uh, programmability should give you a lot more flexibility when you're trying to say substitute assets uh, because you get because it becomes easier to keep track of, of them. That's quite outside of the scope of our paper. Um, but uh, but I don't think that particular aspect is problematic in the kind of environment we, we have in mind. Um, Michael, any, anything to add? Yeah, if I think about it in the context of repo markets, uh, the fungibility, for example, across like general collateral pools, I think that's fine. There's no issue with that because you can still commit to a certain type of asset with that belongs to a, a, a category of assets and that's fine. But here, you know, the, the, the benefit is actually that once by committing certain types of tokens, now in principle, as long as the distributed ledger contains information about future ownership, you, you may not even have to have the token in your account today. And, and that's, I think, kind of the innovation that will happen even before we go into the kind of more intricate and complex usage of the programmability of assets. Uh, so that representation of ownership, I think is more pivotal to it. Now, whether it, the exact orientation of whether it's in an account form or token form is less important, the dynamic representation of ownership is the most important feature that we're kind of emphasizing here. 
so let me add one last thing, which I think is about all of the questions we've been uh, discussing right now. So there's a bit of a tension between saying like, oh, but we can make the comp the the system even more complex than it is today, and that will improve things. And the fact that it, the, the reason we, we decided to uh, focus on, on this idea of uh, some uncertainty is because that's the first thing that the industry has been focusing on. So we, we didn't invent that problem. This is what a number of actual projects are looking at. So if you think of this sort of you know, world of like solution in 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 search of a problem. That's what the that's what a lot of the industry has been interested in, and so we can always say, oh, but that's not the right problem. We should be focusing on a different problem, and and um, and that's perfectly fine. But I think there's a bit of tension between sort of saying like, what can we actually solve versus like, oh, we could make things a lot more complicated, uh, and 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 then solve other things. Thank, thank you, Antoine, for this uh, this sort of uh, uh, last last words uh, in that sense. Uh, I think we have to stop here. It's um, uh, thank you very much. Perhaps as a last um, uh, last well, not really advice in the Q and A box. I saw that uh, people would appreciate it if the people if the paper could have a companion non technical summary on Fox EU. So that would be then the next pro project, Antoine and Michael and 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 and, and Bob. Um, thank you very much for everybody for joining and uh, for the questions and for the I think a very interesting discussion. So uh, I give it back to to Russell. Uh, thank you, everyone. I think we have a very lively uh, presentation today. Thank you, Wilco. Thank you, Antoine. Thank you, Jiguo. Um, so just to remind, on, on May 20, we have our next uh, session, which will be presented by Simon Mayer, currently at Chicago, and will be discussed by Hasu Ferdinand of Penn, and will be moderated by John Frost of BIS. Uh, but in the meantime, so there's a lot of CBDC events. So the next next week, so um, Howard Woolley of Chicago will have the new uh, uh, CBDC seminar series where we'll be talking about the CBDC in Ukraine, a very interesting development. And the next week, so we have the May 13th, uh, will be a conference organized by the CBER, so uh, their second annual conference. So keep an eye on lots of events in this day. <laughs> uh, hope to see you soon. I won't uh, keep you guys too long. So it is large right here and six in the Europe. People are hungry. Okay, good to see you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.